So what uh, we thought we'd, we'd talk about next is, is kind of basic uh, measurement approaches, some of the, of the technology and the, and the ways that these things are, are measured and reported, uh, just to kind of get some of the, of the lingo together. Um, we're going to talk about measuring genetic variation with a variety of different measures uh, listed here and in your handout, uh, then a little bit about linkage disequilibrium and why it's important in these measurements, and then, uh, and then shift a little bit to talk about familial rese resemblance and family history. Um, and I'm a big Gary Larson fan, and this is, uh, hey, what are you looking at, buddy? It, um, you want trouble, you found it. And it's understanding only German. Fritz was unaware the clouds were becoming threatening, as you can see. So, uh, so Tom has just thrown a, a fair amount of, of terminology at you, and, and I'll throw a little bit more. And really, a lot of the difference between, or the, or the differences and challenges in communication between epidemiologists and geneticists are, are merely because of, of a little bit of language dif difficulties. So when we first started trying to measure genetic variation. There weren't very good measures of it. Uh, there were certain things that were known to be genetic, and among them were blood group markers, because they, they clearly uh, clustered in families and were inherited in families. There are enzymes in that. Um, and one of the very first linkage studies, where linkage is looking for co-inheritance in families of a trait and a genetic marker, uh, was this one from the fellow that I, that I actually trained with when I did my PhD, Alec Wilson, um, looking at relationships between the catechol-O-methyltransferase gene, COMT, which is a, a gene related to um, um, adrenergic uh, uh, signaling and that, and 25, only 25 polymorphic uh, marker systems. Uh, and they describe here that they measured the COMT activity in, in five large families. These were very large families uh, from Ohio, 518 individuals. And then they tested associations with 25 genetic markers, including the ABO, the RH blood group, and then a variety of others. And there were only 25 across the entire genome. Uh, and found a LOD score, which at the time was thought to be quite um, quite respectable, 1.27. Um, and this is, it, LOD stands for log of the odd score. We won't go into, uh, Tom's going to do linkage a little bit uh, later. But uh, but anyway, 1.27 with only 25 markers was actually pretty respectable. Um, and uh, and that, uh, a small, a, a close estimated recombination fraction, meaning that the, the marker and the presumed trait locus were close together uh, for this particular uh, enzyme here. So so this actually worked, which was which was exciting. Um, moving from that relatively rapidly um, into the about the 1980s or so were restriction fragment length polymorphisms, and we were just talking about that in, in response to the question um, in terms of, of bacterial endonucleases that actually chop a DNA se uh, sequence at a certain point. So they'll they'll sort of find a string of, of um, uh, DNA, you know, CCGAT, and wherever they see a CCGAT, they chop the DNA, and that's probably the way bacteria insert things into into their own and, and other bacteria's genomes. Um, that allows them to evolve. But for whatever reason, they're, they're there. Um, and they do define polymorphic, lo uh, uh, polymorphic marker loci that can be detected um, as differences in the length of DNA after you digest the DNA with these endonucleases. So depending on where it chops, you may get a longer or a shorter piece of DNA. And you can use that then to establish linkage relationships in pedigrees. And this is an example of this from uh, one of the first papers to describe it. Assume you had uh, here's a, a string of DNA, actually two different strings of DNA, and, and you have your two, this does not want to stay on, uh, your, your two um, um, places where endonuclease B can chop um, right here, uh, and, and here's endonuclease A, and it may chop here and here in this particular person, but that CG, CCGTA may be here and over here in this particular person. And so then when you go to, to run these in a gel, you chop them up, you, you can label them, um, and you see that this, this particular person, or this, if these were both the chromosomes of one person, um, they would have two different fragments here, um, suggesting that they have uh, a polymorphism there, whereas they have the same site um, for endonuclease B, and, and you would only see one fragment. And this was the basis for uh, RFLP-based um, measurements of, of uh, uh, genetic variability, a very laborious, very challenging process uh, by which you had to find all of these endonucleases nucleases and then and actually uh, chop up the DNA with them. Um, and what was, what was foreseen then and, and uh, certainly came to pass was that since they're being used simply as genetic markers, any trait that segregates in a ped pedigree, segregates means that it's, it's inherited in different ways, in the ways that Tom showed, either dominant inheritance or recessive or whatever. Um, and that such a procedure would not require any knowledge at all of the biochemical nature of the trait or of the nature of the alterations in the DNA responsible. All you're doing is putting little signposts in the DNA and then trying to find them, you know, based on the, the um, uh, size of the fragment that, uh, that you're able to detect. 
And this was used very successfully in a variety of traits. It was used to, to identify the neurofibromatosis gene. Uh, Barker and colleagues uh, in, in 1987 looked at 15 Utah kindreds and showed that a gene responsible for neurofibromatosis was located near the centromere, near the middle part of, the, of chromosome 17, the part that attaches to the, um, um, uh, the synaptic apparatus and allows the, the chromosomes to separate uh, during, uh, during cell division. And this is an example of this. It's kind of a kind of a nice one, but you'd need many, 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 many of these in order to come up with a LOD score. Uh, this is a family where mom has um, um, two chromosomes that are, are have the same uh, polymorphism. Dad has uh, one of, of each, um, and and then the, each of the kids, all of the kids are affected, and so is dad. Uh, and basically, you can see here's one band uh, here at the 2.4, and a second band in everybody but the person with the. Um, the one one um, uh, variants uh, who was not affected. So, so this is just demonstrating co-segregation of the disease with the A2, the 1.9 kilobase uh, allele, and not with the A1 uh, allele in each of four affected offspring. And as I say, you need to do this in, in many, many people in order to be uh, confident with it, confident in it. So those were RFLPs. They were um, cumbersome, difficult to work with, uh, and there weren't very many of them across the genome. Tom mentioned variable numbers of tandem repeats, um, mini satellites and microsatellites. I haven't been able to find anyone who can explain why these are called satellites, but regardless, um, their repetition in tandem of a short, maybe six to 100 base pair motif that spans about half a K, uh, KB to several KBs. And this really opened the way to DNA fingerprinting. This is still used in forensic sciences to identify. It was used, um, actually, the, the uh, Genome Institute and NCBI were involved in identifying um, uh, the remains from the, the um, uh, 9 11 disasters and in, in other, in Katrina and other things. Um, and these are, are still used in forensic databases. Uh, it provided the first highly polymorphic multi allelic markers for linkage studies and were associated with many interesting features of human genome biology and evolution. There are, there are a lot of these across the genome. Um, there's, there's sort of curiosity at this point, but one that's quite well known, I think, to cardiovascular epidemiologists uh, is the 5KB Kringle 4 repeat. Kringle is a, uh, actually a name given to a, a, a particular region of a, of a protein that kind of goes in loops, and it looks like a Danish pastry that's called a Kringle. You may see them around here uh, in the morning, but at any rate, um, in the April like protein A G, um, uh, protein and in plasminogen, so these are, are uh, common in, in um, cardiovascular epidemiology. Uh, and this is just a, an example of, of that. Here's the, the gene for um, uh, APOA cDNA. This is the complementary DNA. What you do is you, you find an, an RNA. It's very easy to pick up an RNA um, with that tail of, of the poly A tail that Tom mentioned. If you have a, a column of basically T's that the A binds to, you just run your um, mix of things that might include a messenger RNA down that column, and the A's will stick to the T's, and you can pull them out. This is probably how the cell does it, too, just in a much more elegant way. Um, but then you can make a, a complement to that RNA, which is much more stable, and that's called the cDNA. And it's just a way of looking at structure. So here's a Kringle 4 repeat, um, and there could be anywhere from 1 to 37 of these in humans. There's also a Kringle 5 region that tends not to be repeated. And what's shown very nicely here is just a, 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 a kind of a, a run in, in order uh, uh, gels from a variety of people that have either a 12 repeat, here's the 12 here, and they also have on the other allele 24, and there it is there, or a 13 and the 25, I think, um, 14 and on up, and you can just see them kind of laddering up here, which I thought was a, a nifty picture. So, so that's um, what that looks like, and, and this just shows that, um, that the molecular weight of this, which is related to the number of Kringle repeats, as you can see here, here's the number of Kringle repeats, it's a, a ratio actually to that single KV. Um, uh, five repeat, um, and the molecular weight goes up, and as molecular weight goes up, um, the, the uh, lipoprotein little a levels go down. LP little a has been associated with coronary disease. It's not entirely clear how that association works or, or why, but at any rate, this was a, a, a nice example of it. Um, also called sometimes a very noble, variable number of tandem repeats are microsatellites, which are much shorter. Um, there are two to six base pair motifs. Most of them actually are di, tri, or tetranucleotides, so two, three, or four um, repeated anywhere from 20 to 50 times. And these are highly polymorphic uh, in a population. They were extremely useful for mapping and linkage studies in families. Um, and you may be familiar with the Marshfield Clinic, produced the Marshfield map. Uh, there were similar maps, the decode map, and a, and a number of others. Um, they placed about 400 of these microsatellites across the genome um, and, and provided the primers so that you could, you know, test these in your own um, uh, studies. Um, and these could be highly automated. So the, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the Centers for Inherited Disease Research at, at NIH, both funded very, very large um, linkage studies, not only in humans, but there was a dog map and, and a, a couple of other uh, animal maps as well. 
Um, and this was used uh, in, in great abundance up until about probably five years ago or so. In fact, CIDR retired its microsite satellite pattern just last year, and there was you know, sort of size of relief or, or size of sadness, and depending on how you look at it. Um, so these were used for, for linkage studies, and they produced things that look, uh, graphs that looked a lot like this. This is from uh, my former colleague Dan Levy at the, in the Framingham study, uh, where basically one had one of these markers maybe every 10 um, uh, megabases or so, if you had 400 of them across the genome, so every 10 million uh, bases. And you really didn't need them any more, more frequently than that because studying families, particularly um, smaller families that are closely related, you, you don't get any additional information in this in this interval because families share such large pieces of their chromosomes essentially. So so once you've put in 400 markers, you, you really don't get much more independent information from 800 markers or 1,200 or, or 1,600 across the genome. When you wanted to look at a, a specific region, then you then you well might, uh, particularly in unrelated people. But anyway, this is what uh, microsatellites did for us. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of these really didn't turn out to, to come up with much in the way of genes, and, and some new tricks were needed. High above the Rex, hush crowd, Rex tried to remain focused. He couldn't shake one nagging thought. He was an old dog, and this was a new trick. So it was time for some new tricks in this field. And the new trick, as Tom mentioned, um, was, were single nucleotide polymorphisms. These had been identified and sort of discovered along the way um, that, that other polymorphisms had been identified. And they were thought not to be terribly useful because the dogma had been you needed something that was highly polymorphic in a population, meaning that most people in this room would have two copies and those two copies might, you know, two different copies, and those two different copies would be likely to be different from the person sitting next to them and per different from the person sitting next to them. So that, so that there was lots of variability in that. Well, with a SNP, most SNPs are, are biallelic, so there are only two possibilities. It's either an A or a T, as you can see here, C or an A, or C or a T here. Most of the rest of the genome, 99.9% .9 of it is the same, but in just these couple of spots, you have a, a little bit of a difference, a, a single base pair spelling change in, in your DNA. And how could that possibly you know, tell you much of anything unless you measured thousands of them, people said, um, or maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, and the technology was not available uh, at the time these were first identified to be able to do that. Of course, the technology has caught up and, and actually far surpassed our, our ability to understand it, but, uh, but now we have the technology to be able to measure these um, and, and analyze them. Um, what was needed was some way of mapping the relationships among these. So the, the linkage maps that Marshfield and Decode and others put together, they were able to put together because they had large families that they could follow, um, um, they could genotype and, and look at segregation of their, uh, their markers throughout those families. Um, with these markers, families really wouldn't help you because there were, um, so, so often they would be shared among family members, you really needed to look across uh, unrelated people. But just to give you an idea of, of what this uh, looks like, here's sort of a generic chromosome, and here's like a segment of it that contains a gene, um, and your generic gene has these red things that are exons, um, and then there's some, maybe some SNPs in the exons, and there may also be some SNPs uh, in the introns in between or in the promoter or untranslated regions on either end. Usually there are more SNPs, as we mentioned, in those regions than there are in the exons because they tend not to be as well tolerated um, uh, through natural selection in the, in the exons. And then there are these sort of patterns of association among these. And these triangles tend to throw people. I know when I first saw them, it was like, what in the world are these things? You see them a lot in, in diagrams. Here are some, uh, some stretches of DNA or genes, and then you see these triangles, and they're labeled with various numbers and that sort of thing. Um, and really, we've all been looking at these for a very long time. We just didn't realize that the, these are, are essentially correlation matrices. And if you've ever gotten, you know, maps or tables from the AAA, you ask, you know, sort of how far is it from Boston to Providence? It's 59 miles. From Boston to New York, it's 210. Boston to Philadelphia, et cetera. Um, well, if you were, say, to instead of put, putting these numbers in, maybe you color code them so that the cities that were close together were dark red and the cities that were far apart were, were um, bright white, you can color code them like this, turn them on their side, make them into squares, and, and there's your there's your uh, um, your linkage diagram. So all all of this is sorry your uh, yeah your LD diagram. So all this is is a relationship among um, various SNPs. And when you see these, you know, don't let them throw you. It's it's really just Boston to Providence when it's nice and dark red like that. So. Um, so what that meant then is that one tag SNP can serve as the proxy for many, many SNPs. And so you have these stretches of here, you know, two chromosomes in one person and two in another and two in another. And you can see that these white places are where everybody is the same and then there are some polymorphisms here. And for instance, here's this SNP3, um, which is actually, you know, very closely related to SNP4. Every place that you have a, a, a G in SNP3, you have an A in SNP4. Every place you have a C in SNP3, you have a, a G in SNP4. 
Um, and likewise, uh, or, or in contrast, in SNP5, sometimes when you have an A in SNP4, you've got a G in SNP5. Sometimes when you have an A, uh, I'm sorry, these, these, are, uh, these are, are perfectly well correlated as well. So, so these are, uh, are a block as a SNP2 and SNP1. And so these form a linkage block. And this is a little hard to see. Yeah, so here you have an A and there's a G here. Sometimes you have a G and there's a G here. So knowing SNP4 doesn't tell you a lot about SNP5. But looking at SNP5 and SNP6, they actually are very closely correlated, as is SNP6 and SNP7. And they form another block. So these are just linkage blocks of SNPs that travel together um, and could be measured together. And then you may have, sometimes you have one that's just kind of out there by itself. And so taking away the, the intervening sequence that, that doesn't contribute a whole lot of information, you could just pick one of these SNPs and you'd get all of the information that was uh, in between. So you just pick one. I picked the one with the prettiest color, but you could pick whichever one you want. Um, and similarly, you could just pick one here and you'd still get all of this information intervening and you can kind of stick those together and, um, and the, the sequence of those, what are called tag SNPs, because they tag that whole area, uh, is also known as a haplotype. And maybe you have 35% of your population has this particular haplotype, and 30% has that, and 10% has this one, et cetera. Um, and, and then you can use, basically identify different sort of types within, within a population, and then use those in terms of association uh, relationships to, to various traits. So there are a number of, uh, of ways of sort of estimating the, the correlation between SNPs. The two most common are D prime and R squared. Uh, Lewontin's D is shown here. It's just the probability of, of the two, say, ancestral alleles traveling together versus the, uh, uh, minus the probability of the, the two variant alleles traveling together in order for the variant allele to get, uh, sorry, the variant allele and the ancestral allele uh, traveling together. So in order for the variant and the ancestral to get hooked up together, you have to have a, a recombination event there. And the more, the further a part in general um, that, that uh, SNPs are, the, the more likely there is to be a recombination event. So if this doesn't happen very often, D is very big. There's a D prime, and I confess I've forgotten what the max D is, but it's just a way of correcting uh, D prime for uh, by constant. Um, but one of the problems with this measure is that it tends to overestimate uh, linkage disequilibrium, particularly for rare alleles, because you're looking at the probability of a crossover event measured across populations. If the alleles are very rare, the probability is going to be low that there's a crossover over event just because the alleles are rare, whereas a correlation, just a simple correlation coefficient in R squared um, is, is actually a, a much better, more, more reliable measure, and there's a, a better discussion of this in, in Devlin and Risch. So D prime varies from one, uh, zero to one. Uh, zero is they're completely in equilibrium, one they're um, in complete disequilibrium, and when D prime is zero, typing one SNP gives no information at all about the other SNP. Um, but as I mentioned, it doesn't account for allele frequencies, and R squared uh, is the preferred measure. So when R squared is 1.0, two SNPs are really are in perfect LD. So every time you see a SNP, you know, SNP A in one of them, you see SNP B in the in SNP G in the other. Um, and the allele frequencies are, are identical for both SNPs, and typing one SNP provides complete information on the other. So, so that's uh, what, what you, when you have an LD of 1.0. You might have an LD of you know, 0.98, and perhaps that's because the allele frequencies aren't quite the same, but you know, for the most part, they travel together. So what can LD do for us? It's actually very, very useful. It can mess you up as well as, as really being helpful. Um, and in, the, in design, it's used to estimate the theoretical power to detect associations. Because if you knew that two SNPs were correlated at, at a, um, with an, with an, um, an R squared of 1.0, you'd know that your power would be the same measuring SNP A as measuring SNP B. If, on the other hand, your, your um, R squared is only 0.5, your power is going to be much less to detect an association with SNP A if you're measuring SNP B, because they're not well correlated, so you're adding some noise, essentially. Um, and it does help you then to um, uh, evaluate the, the degree of completeness of your sampling and the choice of the most informative genetic variants to, to genotype. Uh, and just note that sample size increases by about 1 over R squared um, to achieve the same power to detect an association with your SNP that is not quite as tightly correlated as, as the one that you really want to measure, which you hope would be um, the disease-causing SNP. So I, I realize that, that went by a little fast. Any questions on that LD concept? Okay. All right. Um, so what you'll often see then in genome-wide association studies is uh, basically a plot uh, across the, you know, uh, one of the nice things about DNA is that it's a linear molecule, so you can just kind of line up all the SNPs as they occur on the DNA. And what's shown here is for a, a group of, of um, British cases and controls with coronary artery disease and then German uh, families with, uh, with 
coronary disease. Uh, you see the, the association statistics here, and what they're generally plotted on the, on the um, y-axis is the minus log of the p-value, just because it makes it easy to sort of relate to them. So um, uh, 10, a p of 10 to the minus second, or 0.01, would be a 2 down here. Uh, a p of 10 to the minus tenth um, would be a 10 up here, and these, as you can see, are very strong associations, so 10 to the minus 16th, 14th, 16th, et cetera. Um, and then you'll see this linkage block here, and remember this is just the years of block, you know, Boston to Providence, these things are very close together, they travel together, so that if you were to be looking at, at say, these two SNPs, they travel together, they're not going to give you much, too much independent information. Um, up, up here, for example, these now are, seem as though they may be in slightly different blocks, and certainly these are in different blocks from those. So if you were trying to pick things, SNPs that you would then type in a follow-up study, uh, you might want to type those that are in different uh, LD blocks. And one of the other thing, you know, one of the neat things about um, uh, about genetics is that it is constantly changing, and things that were, you know, held to be God's, you know, solid truth um, uh, last year are are no longer. One of the things that was widely known and widely taught was that recombination happens at random across the genome, and and there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's a totally random event. That is clearly not the case. Um, what what happens here, where you can see there's been a recombination event here, but this block tends to be pretty much intact, as does that block. This is just shown in in this family study and shown here in the hap map where there were many more SNPs typed and many more people uh, examined. But what's, what's become very clear is that there are hotspots of recombination, and, and so recombination is not a random event. It actually happens in, in particular regions much more often than in other regions, and that really threw off people when they were sort of trying to map genes and figure out where they, where they uh, were located based on linkage information. Uh, this is an, another kind of similar example of the kind of statistics that you get out of, of these kinds of studies. So again, plotted the, the minus log 10 of the p-value. Um, and in this particular region, there are three genes. There's the interleukin-12 receptor, uh, P2, the interleukin-23 receptor, and then sort of a hypothetical protein. When, when they say hypothetical protein, what they mean is that there's a, a region of the genome that's called an open reading frame, which could be coding for a protein. It basically doesn't have a stop codon for a while. Um, and and so that's a good thing, and probably it codes for a protein. Yes, sir? Uh, going back to the previous slide, I just want to know what the difference is between that uh, block four and five. Okay, so, so this was um, a, the SNP study done in this particular study here, where they, they only typed a, a relatively small number of SNPs in this region, so you notice that the blocks are bigger. The same region was typed much more densely in the hat map, so there are, you know, if there's like three million in the hat map, across the genome, and here there were only probably 300,000 or so. And there are more people. So you can still see sort of the same blocks. They're not lined up very well, and that was a mistake of the, of the editors, but you still see sort of the same blocks there. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so yeah, so here you have these three genes, this hypothetical protein, and then these other two, and here's your association signal, and you're thinking, well, gee, it kind of looks like it's in that gene, um, but if you then look at the, the LD patterns, you can see that there are Oops, there are your genes, um, that there are actually two blocks of linkage disequilibrium. They're not real great. I mean, they're not real solid, but they're, they're certainly there. And it's pretty obvious that, you know, it's probably not this gene that's associated with the signal, nor this hypothetical protein, but it's probably something in here in these two LD blocks. So it can be very helpful for uh, sort of narrowing down an association region. And these are used, they're, they're plotted in different ways. Sometimes you'll see people plot D prime against R squared back in the, in the earlier days, you know, like way back in 2006, um, when, when people sort of were used to the D prime measure, which shown, is shown here in blue, um, and weren't as used to the R squared measure and didn't like it because it didn't make as pretty pictures as the, as the blue one, um, you sometimes see them plotted together. This is TCF7L2. It's the strongest uh, genome-wide association signal found for uh, type 2 diabetes to date. Um, and, and this is the sort of the gene is shown, uh, but this is the, the direction of transcription and then how the various SNPs are associated. And this is a, a similar sort of um, uh, plot of uh, linkage disequilibrium now in the three populations studied in the hat map, and I'll, I'll talk about the hat map I think a little bit more later. Um, but what they, they did was to look at the Yoruba uh, people from Ibadan, Nigeria, which is a, a population of African ancestry that's uh, African ancestry populations are very old. If you follow the out of Africa hypothesis, which is no longer a hypothesis, it's really you know pretty well established. Um, the, the most uh, human variation was in Africa and remained there, and a small piece of it then left and went into 
uh, Europe, Asia, and colonized the Americas. So the African populations, recent African uh, populations, tend to have less linkage disequilibrium because they're an older population. There's been more time for it to break up than younger populations. The um, uh, CEU is the, the CEF population. It's a European ancestry group. And this is the, the Han Chinese and Japanese from Tokyo, uh, an Asian population. And they also have had less time for their LD to break up. And so you can see these triangles are a little bit denser uh, in these two populations than they are in the, in the Yoruba. And you see that over and over again in, in populations of recent African ancestry. And we'll show you in a bit how, how useful that can be. So what was, was desired then was to produce a hat map uh, to do more efficient association studies in unrelated peoples. We wanted to use just the density of SNPs that you needed to find associations between SNPs and disease. Um, so you don't want to type any more than you, than you have to, but you don't want to miss any regions that have a disease association. And the, the goal was really to produce a tool to assist in finding genes affecting health and disease, um, recognizing, as I just mentioned, that ancestral populations differ in their degree of, of LD. Recent African ancestry populations have shorter stretches of linkage disequilibrium, so you need more SNPs for complete genome coverage in that group. SNPs were really a gateway then to genome-wide association studies, and Tom has mentioned those, and we'll be talking about them a lot. In fact, a lot of the, the perspective that you're getting from Tom and me you know, comes from the, the fact that genome-wide association has, is sort of all the rage, and it's all the rage because it's working, where you know, many of the, the previous um, uh, methods of, of interrogating the genome really didn't work in terms of, of identifying um, uh, genetic variants, likely because, particularly for complex diseases, um, you were dealing with, with uh, genes of very small effect, whereas linkage studies were worked great for Mendelian diseases where the genes are a very large effect. So SNPs are much more numerous than others. They're much, you know, other kinds of markers that I mentioned, they're much easier to assay. Uh, Genome-wide studies attempt to capture the majority of the genomic variation, which is 10 million common SNPs, SNPs that are present in, in um, uh, about 5% five, 5 or greater um, of the population. And this variation is inherited in groups, as I mentioned, so you don't have to test all 10 million uh, points, and the blocks are shorter, as I mentioned, um, so you, you need to test more points the less closely people are related. And now we can do studies with uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of markers. And, and this was then the impetus for developing the HAP map. This was published Nature um, in 2005, but the data actually were made available almost as they were produced, as, as soon as they were QC'd. Um, they were made available through the HAP map website um, and, and basically were used for many, many um, genomic discoveries, including the TCF7L2 uh, example that I, that I showed you. Um, the more up, uh, expansive and, and expanded HAP map was published in 2007, last year, uh, of over 3.1 million SNPs. Uh, these, again, are the common SNPs um, that were, were identified and put into linkage patterns. At the same time, and, and perhaps stimulated by the HAP map, genomic technology um, improved dramatically. So this is a, a slide of art from my colleague Stephen Chanick at the, at the NCI. Back in 2001, we thought we were driving a really hard bargain if we could get a, a single SNP genotype um, for about a dollar. So here's, you know, 10 to the second cost per genotype in, in um, in sense, in, in um, American sense. Um, so, so back in 2001 with the, with the TACMAN assay, which was sort of the gold standard at the time, a dollar a genotype was really good. And we were getting, at, at the NIH, you know, people wanted three and four dollars because they weren't using efficient platforms. It was one of the reasons that we um, uh, produced some of the, the large-scale genotyping services that we did because they could be done much more efficiently. And over time, these costs came down. These are the various platforms and the various producers. And you'll notice also that the uh, numbers of SNPs that were genotyped went up. And in fact, the, the uh, flexibility of the platforms went down a little bit, too, because you, you basically had to buy into whatever 10,000 SNP platform a, a particular manufacturer was providing or 100,000 SNP or whatever. Early on, when these things were expensive, people didn't want to measure 100,000. They just wanted to measure 10 or 5 or, or maybe 50. Um, but over time, this sort of paradigm has shifted. And the cost has continued to come down. I haven't over updated this slide in a very long time, uh, but it, believe me, it continues to look like this. Um, the million SNP chip was, was introduced by both of the, these companies about Six, six to eight months ago or so, and the cost of those are running in, in around the $500 to $600 range now. So, so truly, you know, dramatically increased uh, capacity and, and decreased cost. So what that means is that in 2001, if you wanted to type all 10 million SNPs, which is what you'd have to do since you didn't have the linkage disequilibrium patterns, at a dollar a SNP, it would be roughly the budget of the entire National Institutes of Health, which wasn't likely to happen um, in a 2,000-person study. Um, in 2008, we can type about a million SNPs at a cost of about um, 0.05 cents uh, for about a million dollars. So, so about $500 per person for a, a million SNP chip. Um, and, and really, these are, you know, still, still a good piece of change, but it's, it's manageable, whereas before it really was not. <laughs> 
This is just a, a sort of an overview of the coverage of the various more recent platforms. Um, the Affymetrix gene chip 500K was used for the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium that we'll talk about, in, um, I think, at, at some length. Um, and in several of the other uh, studies that we're reporting out in early 2007, uh, it gave a relatively poor coverage and an R squared of 0.08. So that's a, a question asking how, what proportion of the SNPs in the genome are you covering in an R squared of 0.8, sorry, 0.8 um, or better? And in the Yoruba, it was only 46. In the European population and the, and the Asian population, it was a little bit better. Um, the SNP array 6.0, and I left out 5.0, sorry. Um, these numbers are much, much better. And the Illumina platform, similarly, these numbers went up and up. Uh, the Perlogen 600K, uh, about these kinds of numbers. So, so we're getting very, very good coverage now, and it's only continuing to improve. Something just to be aware of is that the polymorphism literature can be a little bit difficult to follow because sometimes the polymorphism is named for the amino acid change. Um, the angiotensinogen gene, M235T, is the methionine to threonine, I believe. Um, the nucleotide sequence, so here are the uh, I forgot what this is, um, angiotensin receptor, I believe, um, and this is a nucleotide change, so it's an A to C change in the C DNA, the complementary DNA we talked about, um, at position 1166. It could be in the promoter region, this is a minus six, um, usually the, the, when you're numbering promoters, it starts upstream of the, uh, uh, of the initiation site, so it has a negative sign. Uh, it could be for a restriction enzyme site, so these are various restriction enzymes that cut the DNA in different places. It could be for the gene product, such as ApoEE2. This is a, a particular uh, protein that's produced by the ApoE gene. There are, are a number of legacy systems, particularly for the major histocompatibility um, uh, complex, the immune system that's used for typing for bone marrow donation and that sort of thing. And that has, it's a very, 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 very polymorphic um, locus, and it has a, a legacy system of naming uh, that goes way back. So uh, it could be from uh, the reference SNP numbers. These are, are from dbSNP that Tom mentioned to you. The reference SNP is the sort of the consensus um, sequence. The submitted SNP is what's submitted by, you know, whoever submits something to dbSNP says, we found a new SNP, here it is, and here's our SS number. Um, and as Tom mentioned, good sources for this information are OMIM, uh, Hugo, and, and the UCSC genome browser actually is a, is a neat one. Um, if you haven't looked at it, it's, uh, we won't show it to you here, but you can Google UCSC genome browser, that's how I found, find most things genomic. Um, and if you, if you put in either a gene, um, I tend to remember APOE because it's cardiovascular, um, and, and just ask it to, you know, show me the segment of the genome uh, around APOE, it will show you the, all of the SNPs in the, in the region, it will show you the conservation in various different species, uh, and a whole bunch of other things, so, so it's really pretty cool. I, I don't have time to go into other genomic technologies. One to be aware of that's, that's sort of coming on the horizon and will probably drive uh, genome-wide association out of business is sequencing. Uh, this is to measure the variation at every point um, in every gene or candidate region in dozens to hundreds of people to find all of the functional variants. That's the way that it's used now. We anticipate that um, um, within probably not too many, too many years, uh, the $1,000 genome, as it's been called, um, will be a reality, which means we can sequence an, an individual's genome for about $1,000. Remember that the first genome project probably cost about $2.5 billion. Um, so that's a, a several orders of magnitude improvement in, in cost, um, and those costs are coming down, you know, day by day. Uh, gene expression is measuring changes in messenger RNA, which is the transcription part, in cases in, constro in controls or in response to stimulation, and you'll see some uh, expression studies. Epigenetics are to measure changes on top of the DNA, it's what the epi part means, um, that turn, either turn the DNA on or off, or at least make it available or less available for transcription. So depending on how um, DNA is methylated, it, it may... Uh, um, the polymerase, RNA polymerase may not recognize a site as a transcription start site and may kind of skip over it and then not transcribe that. Or the DNA may be wrapped around histones, which are the, the proteins that, that kind of bind it up into chromatin, and it may be wrapped so tightly or in such a way that it's not accessible to unwinding to then be uh, transcribed. That's what histone deacetylation does uh, that can turn genes on and off. So we're not going to talk about those very much. So I just pause for a breath for a second, and this is, gee, I never realized we'd have to know so much geography. Um, and you, you may not have realized you'd have to know quite so much molecular biology, but that's probably, you know, the, the most of, of at least genetic structure and function that, uh, that we'll need to know. So just to summarize on, on genotyping points before I get to familial uh, information, there's been unbelievably rapid progress from small number of blood group markers to more than 10 million SNPs, CNVs, structural variants, sequence variants, 
and the technology is continuing to change is one of the challenging things about this field. I haven't talked at all about copy number variants. They're sort of the latest, greatest new thing, um, and there are, they basically are being typed through um, um, SNPs, so I, I won't go into them much, but we can talk about them if you like. Um, and as I, I mentioned, there's, there's more to come in Lecture 4 uh, on genome-wide association studies. Quality control is a major issue, and, and we'll be talking about that as well. But I did want to talk a little bit about familial resemblance. Um, this may be a, a group of, of gentlemen. Whoops, no video signal. That's not good. So, familial relationships. Okay. Um, yeah. Basically, there are, there are a, a couple of ways of looking at. If I'm going to touch it anyway. Let's see. No, come on, touch screen to enlarge. Yes. Um, so the traits more similar among related than un unrelated persons makes sense. That's that would be resemblance and clustering uh, is often a, a measure of risk of disease in the relative of somebody who has it being greater than the risk of somebody who doesn't have it, um, or of, of people in the general population. Um, this has been called the sibling relative risk. I like to call it the relative relative risk, um, or Risch's lambda sub s. It's also referred to. Uh, one can also look at distributions of a continuous trait. This doesn't have to be in individu in, uh, related individuals, but if they're, it's, it's also called mixtures of distributions or a commingling analysis where, say, you find two or three means in a population. So instead of a nice mean distribution, you see like a big group and then a smaller group and then a smaller group. Um, that suggests that maybe there's a major gene that's producing each of those three. You don't often see those kinds of things, and when you do, they, they're not necessarily um, related to um, uh, genetics, but, but in cholesterol measures, for example, people with heterozygous uh, um, familial hypercholesterolemia will, will give you a bump in kind of the middle of the distribution um, with a long tail. Uh, and then those who have the, the homozygous state will be way, way out here, but a little bump in, in that too. So. So that's another way of looking at them. This, this is an example of uh, relative risk. This is sibling relative risk, and it's, it's actually a, a good a risk of a good thing, living to age 90 um, at, at various ages, depending on whether you had a sibling who was a centenarian or a sibling who had died at age 73. Uh, and shown here is, is at, in people who are age 64 who had a centenarian uh, as a sibling, there was really not any, any greater chance that they would live to be uh, age 90, but as they got older, there was much greater risk, and particularly when they got up into their 80s, um, they were much more likely to make it to age 90 if they had had somebody before them to whom they were related who had made it to age 100. So that's a nice example of a relative risk. Um, you can also find these um, with larger families, then, then it's easier to, to at least assess relative risks in, in larger families. Um, this is a, a group, the group in, in Iceland uh, is blessed by having a, a relatively small country that has not had a lot of in-migration and out-migration and does have a, a total uh, national obsession with genealogy. So they, they absolutely love genealogies. They can all trace their ancestry back to the, like, the 10th century or so. When they meet each other, they say, oh, I knew your grandmother. She was my uncle uncles, you know, school teacher. And that. So anyway, uh, and this is a, a representative, truly a representative pedigree um, of uh, people with uh, atrial fibrillation here going, going, as you can see here, uh, six generations with the various uh, affected individuals shown. Uh, and this allowed us to then look at the, the risk ratio. These were basically prevalence ratios of atrial fibrillation in first degree relatives, in second degree relatives, third, fourth, and fifth. And you notice that this kind of decreases in, a, in almost a halving uh, um, exponentially, which is, is very consistent um, with the um, inheritance of a, of a major gene. And in fact, uh, Arnar and others uh, then, then published a, the uh, genome-wide association study of atrial fibrillation uh, just last year and showed that they found, found a, um, a genetic variant related to this. So sibling relative risks are one way of looking at these for, for discrete traits. For continuous traits, you can look at correlations among relatives. Um, this was when Garrod was looking at, uh, Garrod Archibald, I think, um, one of the earliest geneticists uh, looked at, at relationships among relatives. He studied height and showed that, um, that basically an offspring's height is the, is the midpoint of the two parents' heights, um, and one can regress that, basically. Uh, so you can regress one, one relative's value on the other um, in just a simple regression analysis shown here. The height of the offspring is the mid-parent mean plus uh, by a beta coefficient plus a, um, the population mean. And then twice this parent off offspring correlation is an estimate of heritability or the proportion of variance in the entire population that is explained by presumably genetics, probably some shared family environment as well. If the trait is under genetic control, you expect the correlations among closer relatives to be greater than those among distant relatives. 
And here are some familial correlations um, uh, after Wendy Post et al. in hypertension. Uh, spouse correlations are often used as sort of a control for familial correlations. If there's a high spouse correlation, we generally assume in the US spouses are unrelated, and so that suggests that shared environment may be more important than genetics. Um, but in 855 pairs, the correlation between spouses was 0.05, the expected would be zero. Parent offspring pairs it was 0.15. The expected, if it was a single gene that was causing this, would be 0.5 because parents and offspring share um, half their, exactly half their genes. Siblings share on average half their genes, uh, their variants. Um, and the correlations here were similar, suggesting that there might be some environmental factors as well that are bringing this down. And avuncular pairs, which are, are niece, uncle, uh, nephew, uh, nephew, aunt, et cetera, um, were smaller than that, and, and that would be uh, expected as well. So this is suggestive. It's not real strong, but uh, but it's, it's some suggested uh, familial correlations for a continuous trait. Uh, and as I mentioned, assessing the familial and genetic nature is, is um, uh, generally done by looking at heritability. It's often designated as either a capital H or an H squared, or sometimes sigma squared G over sigma squared P, which is the proportion of the phenotypic variance P explained by the genotypic or genetic variance sub G. Um, and I just uh, reiterated that here. Um, it's a, both a population and an environment specific parameter, so, so it changes from population to population depending on how, how much environmental influence there is. There will be, if there's more environmental influence adding to the, the phen total phen phenotypic variance, this proportion is going to go down. If you can keep the environment constant, it's gonna, everything is going to look genetic, and so this, this proportion will go up. Um, keep in mind that its value does not indicate the role of genes or variants in any specific individual, but it allows you to sort of predict the expected degree of familial aggregation of a trait. And it was anticipated the traits that had high heritability should prove uh, fruitful in identifying trait-related genes. Probably the trait with the highest heritability that's, that's known is height. Um, height actually did not yield itself very well to, uh, to identifying genes. Um, in or, or genetic variants or genes um, in, in linkage studies, but actually um, uh, has done, has been really a gold mine uh, in gene-wide association studies. And just a, another way of looking at this percent of variants explained um, for uh, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme activity, ACE activity in fathers, mothers, and siblings, and these are just the, the uh, um, a major gene effect um, uh, affecting this and the proportion of variants explained. Um, and uh, just a, 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 sort of to point out that up until now, we, we really haven't, we hadn't found any genes at all, but even those that, that we found really don't seem to explain the vast majority of the heritability that had previously been identified. So height, 90% variability, the variants found to date explain only about 3% of them. Does that mean that you know, there are many, many, many more variants to be found, or does it mean that environmental influences haven't been um, uh, taken into account as well? It's not quite clear. Type 2 diabetes has a, a sorry, a lambda sub S, or the risk to your sibling if you have diabetes is about threefold, three to fourfold. Uh, so far, the variants that, that have been identified have a lambda sub S of only about 1.07. Um, C-reactive protein was, was estimated, has been estimated in the Reiner and Ridker papers that were recently published um, as having, uh, they, they've estimated about 10.5% of the, of the variants explained by the variants that they identify. Um, I'm not sure that I, that I trust that. That seems awfully high, and the total uh, variance is 30 to 50%. This needs to be replicated. It's, these are new studies. Um, and a, a recent psoriasis study, for example, a lambda sub S in, in siblings is 4 to 11, maybe about 7 or 8 um, on, on average. Um, there were about nine variants in this particular paper that were at 1.3. If you were to multiply all of those out, if you had each one of them, uh, you might be explaining, um, you know, a lambda sub S of, of in the 8 to 9 range. So, so these, it's, it seems as though you're getting more and more of the variants explained. These are also newer and newer studies, and I suspect that they won't replicate. Uh, keep in mind that the, the first estimates that you get of a, of a relative risk in any risk factor, whether it's smoking or whatever, tend to be overestimates because you've, you've had some variability in order to be able to find that, that estimate, and we'll talk about that in a, in a bit as well. Tom had asked me to comment just briefly, and that's all I'll do, on, on Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium because he'll be talking about it a fair amount um, in, in the next talk. Um, remember that he talked about Mendel's second law, that the occurrence of two alleles of a SNP in the same individual are two independent events. Um, and those, those basically segregate separately. 
There are ideal conditions at which an, an equilibrium is established and maintained among them. That was described by two, actually, epidemiologists, Hardy and Weinberg. Um, and those conditions are random mating, which we generally do not have in the U.S., um, no in or out migration, no inbreeding, no selection, there's equal survival of the offspring, no mutation, large population sizes, and the genes frequencies are equal in male and f males and females. Um, very few of these conditions actually hold, but they're not all that critical for estimating Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And if alleles big A and little a of a SNP, given SNP, have frequencies um, P and 1 minus P, then the expected frequencies of the three genotypes, and probably all of us learned this in high school, um, then are P squared 2 times PQ, or P times 1 minus P, and 1 minus P squared. And this is a very useful um, uh, equation to test. It used to be used to, to sort of identify whether there was selection pressure against one genotype or another. Um, these days, it's actually more likely to indicate genotyping error, particularly because heterozygotes on the current platforms are much tougher to type than the homozygotes, so what you tend to have is fewer heterozygotes than you would expect um, by Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So it's, it's worthwhile keeping that one in mind. I think that's about where I'm at. So um, keep in mind that uh, familial clustering is an indicator of possible genetic influence. It's just a hint. It doesn't necessarily mean that there are genes at play. It may overestimate the genetic component due to either poor assessment of the environment or um, uh, poor adjustment for shared environment among families. Uh, and methods for assessing it include twin studies, parent offspring correlations, uh, sibling or relative relative risk, and percent of variance explained. And current genes um, that we've identified so far for complex diseases really explain only a tiny fraction of heritability. And that unexplained heritability has been called the dark matter of, uh, of complex disease genetics. So I think I'll stop at that point, and I believe there's a question there in the back. So thank you. Questions? So, so I think they'd like you to use the microphone. I'm sorry, we, we wanted to tape this. We're actually not live webcasting it, but we wanted to have it available for posterity so that when Martha or others ask, you know, can you give a course, we could say, look at our website. <laughs> oh, I, I'm just curious about the height. I mean, you said it's gold mine. Did you know why they said you... Mm -hmm. the is any oh, it's a gold mine because there are like 20 different variants for it now. Um, but, oh, they, but each one explains a very, very, very small proportion of the variants. So variant T and then variants CE. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's done very well. Diabetes has been another biggie. Um, Crohn's disease has come up with, with 15 or 20 or so. But, but again, they don't explain, you know, the heritability that has been estimated. And my, my personal belief is that we've overestimated the heritability. We're not accounting for the shared environment nearly well enough. But that's just my belief.